Hello. Hello. Did, uh, How are you? Good. My my other session just finished. I don't even know what happened. I was trying to message the presenters to let them know that, hey, I got to go to my next meeting. Um, yeah. And they, uh, it just all of a sudden they just kicked me out. I don't know if it, because I have another meeting. I don't know what it did. Same thing happened to me with the other one. It was so strange. I was about to give them, I was just giving them heads up, telling them, hey, we need to wrap this up because I need to start the other one. Right. Because anytime, because we're hosts, when we end something on one end, it, if we want to start this, we need to it, end the other one. <laughs> so, right. so bizarre. Okay, yeah, well, we're here. <laughs> let's see. We're we have people in. Yeah, I know. This is like a multitasking situation here. And uh, so this is John and Jody are doing this one? Yes, and they're I hear both in the, they're both in the other meeting. Okay, well, as soon as we see them, we'll make sure to welcome them. Let me quickly message in the in the in the waiting room, letting people know that we'll start shortly. Okay. Wow, it's like running around almost between classrooms. <laughs> yeah, that's what it felt like. I, I was like, whoa, whoa, whoa. <laughs> I'm like, I yeah. gotta go. I told, I told her, I was like, I told her, I'll be, at least be there. But I, I didn't realize, I was like, oh, this is getting close. Like, I know. No, I, yeah, I actually did live early. I made Kaylon the, co the host for that one. But when I tried to start this one, it gave it the off. It only told me I can do it once I end the other one. I was like, no, no, no. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and I've let, Susie, I've let Susie know, so she's aware. Hopefully, yeah. this didn't happen to anyone. Like, nothing crazy happened to anyone. <laughs> yeah, the way it kicked me out, I was like, oh, my gosh. I hope I did not just stop that meeting. <laughs> yeah, no. No, I definitely wasn't asked because I was going to ask Susie about this. So, oh, oh okay. well. <laughs> I'll have to let her know that this happened. <laughs> yeah, and then the first session as well, um, there was two, Becky, Zhang, and I were the supposed to be alternative hosts. Cool. But mm -hmm. I guess if you click on the email from Zoom and you hit start this meeting, you come in as a regular uh, guest. So when I click the, the email link from, from Zoom, you have uh... to click the, the meeting ID instead of start this meeting. Mm -hmm. uh, because Becky and I both ended up as regular guests, and then the presenter had to put us as hosts, co-hosts. Interesting. <laughs> yeah, so. I use, yeah, I use Susie's link because I figured it must be different for us. So. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but I'm, I'm glad I did that because it brought me as a host right away. And actually, yeah. this what happened to you happened to Kaylon. I had to make her a co-host because she was in the <laughs> waiting room. <laughs> well, yeah, that's what we, I was like, um, we're stuck in the waiting room. I had to email the presenter and then and she just, uh, so yeah, that's what mm -hmm. I figured. So this time what I did was I clicked the meeting ID instead of the, uh, yeah. The, the start this meeting. So. <laughs> right, right, right. Now, uh, Robert, did you talk to the presenters on the logistics yet? Sorry, I just quickly wanted to, to touch base no, with you. No, no, okay. they, no, they were in the other one, but they're John and and, and uh, Jody. They're pretty good. You know, yes, they are. That's what Susie told me. So, I mean, they are the <laughs> DE people. The pros, so, distance yeah. education. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. How are, how are you enjoying your your role? <laughs> Oh, it's so busy, Robert. I'm like trying to keep up. <laughs> yeah, it's uh, so much. Yeah. It's always I mean, nonstop for you guys. I mean, we've been a lot of it for me was convocation prep. I've been preparing for that presentations uh, presentation since July. <laughs> so every day it's been yeah, a lot of work. <laughs> but hey, I'm surviving. <laughs> oh, you froze. I froze or you froze? And I was just informed that our presenter is on, the, on her way. So thank you everyone for your patience once again.
Hello. Welcome, Jody. We already have um, introduced you. <laughs> oh, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, um, some Zoom problems there. Um, our last session, we got booted out too. I have no idea what's happening there. Yeah, I've heard that was happening. I'm not sure why that also happened with our previous session. So, um, but it's okay. According to our president, flexibility is the keyword of the day and of the week and of the semester. So I think we're good. Absolutely. <laughs> I will okay. uh, let you maybe inform everyone um, how you'd like to address questions whenever the time is for questions and I'll let you get started. Absolutely. Hi, everyone. Um, hopefully it hasn't been too much of an immersive day for you and that you've already learned a lot of good stuff. Um, thank you for joining us for the eCampus. It's, um, it's an interesting uh, presentation because it has changed a little bit. Um, but in any case, I do have uh, my team here to assist. Um, it's going to be more of a, um, I wouldn't say informal, but it's going to be a higher level overview of the resources that we are providing for you in this eCampus. Um, some of you might remember that um, John and I presented in January on the eCampus. I know some of you were there. If you want to have your reaction and raise your hand. Um, it's, it's not going to be redundant, but certainly um, there are features. We didn't, um, we didn't anticipate that we would be here when we presented that in January. Um, so with that, uh, I'll introduce the team. Let me see. Um, Sue, are you on the line here? Sue Yang. Yes, I'm here, Jody. Ah, yeah. Wonderful. Um, if you haven't had um, a chance to meet Sue Yang, um, she is our new instructional designer, and she will be um, assisting us with her expertise to help support faculty. Uh, when we hired her, uh, that pool of faculty was a lot smaller, <laughs> if you know what I mean. <laughs> so um, welcome, Sue. And of course, we have um, John Wilson, our uh, ever-wise um, academic support academic technology support specialist. Uh, yes, his title has changed, but his job remains the same. So thank you, John, for all that you, you do. Um, Carolyn DeAnda is also joining us. I see her picture on the screen. Um, she is an instructor from digital media and arts and is a perfect complement to um, instructional design. So she'll be helping us with leading some workshops and um, sharing um, some of her effective practices um, as you move forward with your distance education journey. <laughs> and then um, just as a, a footnote, we also have um, Christina McCullough Martinez, who is um, not on this session, I don't believe, but she is um, also joining us um, she's from uh, Fine and Performing Arts, specifically theater and design. Um, so a different kind of design, but she's um, also joining our team. And I'll give you a list of workshops um, that all of those people are listed as presenters. So um, how are you guys doing? I like to, Sue started off her last session that way, just asking, how is everybody doing? Um, you can feel free to unmute yourself and and chime in. You have to unmute though. If you have a bingo card, then somebody didn't um, unmute. You could put a little peg on that one. <laughs> Darcy, I see you're unmuted. How are you doing? She's smiling. It's good to see you, Jody. Oh, Rio. Rio, I'm looking for you in this. Um, I'm in, I'm in the people. list. I'm in the list. Keep swiping. Keep swiping. <laughs> Welcome, Rio. Um, so good to see you back. I do miss um, the convocation hug. I do, too. 
I, I, I do too. It's been my yeah. favorite message that I've gotten from people. I've missed the hug. I'm like, yes, I missed the hug. <laughs> yes. Um, well, as an unusual semester, I think we're all going to be seeing each other a lot more than uh, we normally would, right, in, in this kind of format. So I'm um, happy that. to uh, see the silver lining there. Um, so how, how's everybody else doing? Um, Vincent, I see you on the line. Alicia. <laughs> I'm doing fine, Jody. Thank you. Oh, very good. Very good. Steven, how are you doing? Are you, do you have a, a blue screen behind you, Steven? Are you playing with um, virtual backgrounds? Yeah. <laughs> okay, well, um, welcome everyone. Um, I hope that you got some time to relax over the summer. Um, I uh, can't say that about the, the team that uh, has been working to prepare for the fall for you. Um, I sincerely wanna thank the um, facilitators um, I'm going to pull up uh, the screen of their name so you can see that while um, while I'm I'm uh, embarrassing them. Um, so can you see that? It's a blue slide. Just any shake of yes. Thank yeah, you, Joseph. Yeah, you got it. And Rio, verbal recognition. Thanks. So um, check this out. I don't know if you were able to see this slide as it quickly passed you in convocation yesterday, but um, this is truly amazing. Uh, we set off in uh, May uh, to start preparing faculty for summer uh, teaching with distance education, uh, 140 people in one month. Uh, that was really special. And then uh, we had uh, 28 folks going through the at one program. Um, they started that March 13th, which was three days prior to us closing the campus. Uh, I really have a lot of admiration for that group because they um, flipped their classes uh, themselves that they were teaching and then they took at one certification program, which is 120 hours for full DE certification and they uh, finished. I don't know how, <laughs> but a couple of them are on here. So uh, perhaps we'll have a session at, at another time so they can share uh, their survival, <laughs> their survival <laughs> mechanisms. Um, and then of course, uh, kept going through the summer. Um, so far, 517 faculty uh, have gone through basic training, the introduction to course design. Um, and that is part of the FCC ecosystem uh, for the eCampus, because without trained faculty, um, there is no teaching and there is no learning. So uh, really, really, um, I can't say enough about this list of, of folks. Um, we do still have uh, 60 people that are finishing up this weekend, hopefully. <laughs> so we will be getting uh, close to that 600 mark. Um, and if you, if you know folks who haven't gone through training yet, um, we are offering um, sessions, they're probably not teaching yet. We're, we are offering sessions for those that are starting in the back nine, as it's called, and spring. So um, I imagine many of you were a part of the training this summer. Can you use the reaction button down in, in your screen on the right hand side at the bottom, it says reactions. And you can do either a thumbs up or clapping of hands to indicate if you were in training this summer. Ooh, that's a lot of yellow Homer Simpson hands. I just see the yellow popping out at me. <laughs> oh, wonderful, wonderful. Uh, somebody wanna share their, their impression? How did it go? How was the introduction to course design? Was it all you dreamed of? It was awesome. I enjoyed it. I had and Carolyn and she was so informative. She taught me things that I didn't even know I could use on um, online. And so it was very informative. And then she had little meetings where if you wanted extra help, oh. it was great. I felt like I learned a lot. Yeah, 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 well done. Um, Maxine, right? I just saw your name. Yeah, Maxine. Yes. Okay. 
Um, that's wonderful. Thank you for that feedback. Um, someone else you want to share your experience, uh, maybe about the myths and, and realities of that introduction to course design? Yeah, I actually wanted to say that I feel like I had been using Canvas haphazardly and doing an okay job with communicating to my students. But after taking the intro to course design, I was able to piece the puzzle pieces, you know, for lack of better words, uh, better together. And my experience teaching online this summer was vastly different. And I felt so much more prepared. And I'm excited to continue the training because I know that my skills will grow. It was really helpful and I cannot thank you enough. Oh, that is so wonderful. Gosh, I just got chills when you were talking about that. Because ultimately, you know, that, trans, that transfers to our students and we really do want to give you, um, you we want to help um, educate, uh, train, share um, effective distance ed uh, practices. And um, I think many of you are realizing that um, you can't just take what you do in the classroom via direct instruction and transfer it over to a distance education environment. Um, that is a lot of work if you try to replicate. So um, yes, we will have ongoing training. We are not leaving you at the first day of, of school. We're gonna continue on and I'm actually going to uh, show you some of the workshops that uh, we have coming up next week and in week two. So I'm looking forward to that. Um, if you have a particular um, skill set, I already heard from you, Alicia, and Paul, she volunteered you. Um, if you have a particular skill set that you would like to share with your peers, um, please uh, send me a, an email um, because we intend to have workshops throughout the semester. Um, it's a scaffolding process. Um, it generally takes three full semesters before a distance ed instructor is really comfortable um, with their course. I don't say that to um, discourage you, I say that to encourage you, all right? So um, the, the most, uh, most effective uh, survival skill right now is to lean on each other, lean on each other in your departments. We have had um, a lot of faculty who've been sharing their, their shelves, which is their Canvas courses, but um, we have developed a lot of other um, support for you. So um, this list of uh, facilitators, that's what we're calling them at this time, um, most of them will continue on um, to help support our efforts. We certainly hope that all of them will. I just know of a few right now. So um, we will con be continuing on um, with those trainings. And again, we could not do it um, without the um, expertise patience, um, determination of those facilitators. See, I can't say enough about them. Um, so uh, does anybody have any questions before I move on? That might be a little bit dangerous for me to offer that, but um, I'm going to do it anyway. There's about 34 questions in the chat right now. I think, um, Carolyn and Sue, are you monitoring the, the chat for us? Uh, Joby, I don't have host access. Okay, so you can't answer those in there, huh? Um, I can work it for you, for sure. <laughs> Happy to do that, I'll answer okay. what I... Who needs to be a co-host? Please let me know, I can make you a co-host. Yeah. Oh, there you go. Sure. Right. Go ahead. I'll, I'll uh, answer what I can for everybody. Who is that? I'm sorry. What's her name? Carolyn. Carolyn DeAnda. Thank you, Carolyn. Sorry. Yeah. So, um, you know, whatever questions we don't get to that are in the chat, um, we will um, post the answers to those, the Q&A. Um, but most of them uh, will be taking and creating um, information to share with folks. Because you know what we tell our students, right? If you have a question, there's probably other students who have that same question. So we're applying that same, that same idea here. So um, 
So keep putting your, your questions in the chat and um, Carolyn can answer those for you and Sue. Um, so, so yes, eCampus and you. Uh, so <laughs> when I say eCampus, um, what do you think of when I say that Fresno City College has, um, is an eCampus? What's that mean? accessible by electronics okay um accessible by electronics yes uh, uh terry yes. um so what's accessible what what does it take to have an e-campus what's in there <laughs> an internet connection <laughs> that's pretty important a little bit yeah, a little bit <laughs> well, as we all know many of the students we have to we have to help they don't have access to the internet regularly or consistently that's absolutely true um and an unfortunate side effect of of this um this pandemic um of course we we are like everybody else in the country um working to uh satisfy the demand but it's extremely difficult because um not because we're not trying but because the supply chain is drying up um, a lot of our uh, devices come from China. I'll just let you play with that for a second. Um, so, so yeah, we're doing the best we can to get those um, devices into the hands of students. Um, I don't know if you heard it yesterday. It is quite unusual, but we do have Wi-Fi access in our parking lots. Um, lot K, actually just Lot K. So um, students can go um, there. Uh, it would be wonderful to see people six feet apart and outside, wouldn't it? That would be a great scene. Good photo opportunity, um, Carolyn. But, you know, we're going to do whatever we can to um, help students uh, participate in their virtual teaching and learning. Um, have any of you ever had uh, one of your children um, become a Fresno City College student? You can do a reaction on that, too. Uh, thumbs up or clapping. Yeah, both of my kids have gone to City College. Yeah, so um, Sarah, right? Yeah. Yeah, so Sarah, uh, what's the first thing that students do when they want to become a student here? They just signed up. And... <laughs> but this was years back, yeah. Yeah, um, she makes it sound so easy. You just sign up. <laughs> <laughs> Um, yeah, so you have to become a student and then register for classes, right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I actually had my daughter in my own class, so. Hmm. Um, have, have any of you ventured into WebAdvisor to take a look at the class schedule? I usually <laughs> do at least once a semester. That's good. Um, so a student, be, before they um, get to your class, they've been through a gauntlet of attempting to get to get there. Um, that means more to me now than ever because my son became um, a first time Fresno City College student over the summer. And um, <laughs> I had no idea about the process and um, the hurdles and the, <clears throat> the confusion that our website can bring rather than clarity. So. Um, I have a lot more um, empathy for our students now because of, because of his experience. Um, ultimately, when he got to the classroom, though, things were great. Um, so it's just <clears throat> knowing how to jump through those hurdles that is really difficult. So um, with that, um, once a student gets into your class, um, they have all kinds of, let me pull this up. They have, um, whoops, fast here. They have all kinds of um, support opportunities that not all students know about. Um, and so what we did is, is um, if you saw the feature yesterday, um, we created the Student Support Hub. Um, and as I mentioned yesterday, it was just in its infancy. It was just an idea in uh, last January. Um, and so we uh, sped up its growth, uh, tried to push it quickly through the teenage years, 
<laughs> and, and now it's here. Uh, so we sincerely um, hope that this is helpful for students. Um, this was opened in, in March. Uh, we opened it and we added all students um, into the Student Support Hub. And we were able to field questions from students too who are messaging us in there. Um, and we had hundreds, hundreds of students um, asking questions about, well, everything. Um, and some of them um, expressed how they were doing. And so knowing how, um, if a student is struggling, knowing how to get in contact with psych services, you know, so that they can get some, some support for their wellness is really critical. Um, so we included a, a bunch of resources in here. Some of them are statewide, but most of them um, pull together our website and the information, so pull it into one place. Um, so again, I think this is um, a really phenomenal thing for students and for you too. Um, as I said yesterday, you're gonna get questions from your students outside of criminology, right, Terry? Outside of art, um, about all those parts of, of an e-campus. So we hope that you will make this um, an active part of your class. Um, we will have, <clears throat> excuse me, students um, answering questions from students in the first uh, week or two. And we're looking for faculty to engage in, in those Q and A's as well. Um, we don't know how many we'll get. Um, on an average semester, we get um, a couple of hundred in the first two weeks. And that's because we used to um, enroll all distance ed students into uh, what used to be known as Quest. And so we would encourage them to ask questions. Um, now that our whole campus is an e-campus, um, we anticipate that, that we're gonna get a lot more. So um, please make sure that you check that out if you haven't already done so. Um, I know a lot of people expressed interest in it yesterday. Um, this is, uh, uh, example of the badge that they can earn for online readiness. So when we talk about the eCampus, um, it's student support services, it's instruction, um, it's everything that holistically a student needs. And for some of them, uh, we are their only support system. And so I really um, want to recognize the passion and dedication and commitment of our instructors. Um, we have a very unique opportunity to change the lives of people. And in COVID right now, that's um, even more important than ever. So thank you. Thank you for the job um, that you do and for being a part of our college. So, um, so the badges, as uh, some faculty were asking, well, can I assign this? Um, yeah, absolutely. You can um, encourage students to uh, take the online readiness um, and then they can take a screenshot of their badge um, and send it to you. Um, and this is also very mobile friendly. It's ready to go. Um, so we hope that um, you'll encourage students. In fact, they're told um, when we write them that um, your instructor may or may not ask you um, for the badge for this course. So we kind of nudge them a little bit because uh, it's, for, it's for their own good. <laughs> All right, so um, I want to introduce you to some of the services and I, I'm going to do something kind of unique here um, in showing you the live um, site, if I can get out of this one. Um, showing you our live um, faculty support hub. I know it's it's not crisp yet. Um, it's not quite fully baked, um, but it is in the works. So uh, we will publish this uh, later today um, or tomorrow morning, uh, but we, we uh, will invite everyone um, to connect to this and we will be uploading all faculty um, into the hub. So you don't have to hunt around for it. It, it will be right there. Some of you might remember the old teacher toolbox, right? The old teacher toolbox. That toolbox was overflowing with information, <laughs> making it hard to find 
uh, the wrench you needed because there are about 20 different wrenches in there. Um, and uh, excuse me, Jody. Uh, yeah. Uh, there is a request to enlarge the PowerPoint or the or the your screen. Perhaps a Control Plus to for people to see the oh, con Control Plus. Better. I think okay. that should be able to. Yes. Happy Thank you very much. So. Yeah. Is that okay? Nancy, is that better? Better. So I can go bigger, but then I'll have to um, I'll have to zoom in and out, which I'm more than happy to do. That's good. Thank you so much. <clears throat> yeah. So you can see that this has a similar uh, look and feel to the Student Support Hub. It's really important for us to design things very cleanly because we are representing an entire eCampus, right? So that's a lot of information. Um, generally, in design. Uh, it's most effective to have things that are one to two to even three clicks away. If you've ever had um, a website that has driven you crazy into a clicking abyss, uh, we're trying to avoid that. Um, we are also trying to design for mobile in mind, and we will be offering a workshop to help uh, faculty do that same uh, practice to design for mobile. Um, if you are unsure how your class looks in a mobile setting, I encourage you to download the uh, Canvas app. Uh, there's a teacher app and a student app, and you can go in and see what it looks like on your phone. It's really quite the experience um, to enable us to understand uh, what a student needs to do in order to get to an assignment or a module and then the submission process. So in this hub, uh, we have for you, again, it's the same look and feel as the student hub. We have uh, faculty online resources. Um, our student online resources are in there as well. Uh, we had lots of faculty asking us yesterday uh, to see the Passport to Canvas and the online student readiness so that they can partner um, with their students um, to help them if they have areas that are deficient that they need a little extra help. So um, both of those, the online readiness, online student readiness workshop is what we're calling it. Um, because when we called it a course, students uh, would write, I didn't enroll in this course. How do I get a grade in this course? Um, you know, uh, those sorts of things. How do I drop this course? And so we're trying to play with some language to make it um, understandable of what it is. Um, we also will have um, our DE support team uh, in here for you, as well as contact information, uh, opportunity to schedule appointments, and then um, I'll skip down here, workshops and training um, is where we will have an ongoing list of workshops and then the archives that go with those. And then uh, faculty support in general um, that will also be uh, live hours, um, outside information um, from folks like At One and the California Virtual Campus. Um, I'll introduce those more to you later. I understand that a lot of this is really new information to you and there's a, a spirit of cognitive overload. Um, and that is the same for our students. So we're all trying to be flexible and understanding about those things. It really is a lot. Um, I was a, a teacher online for over 10 years. I taught history, so it was a very large course, large uh, courses. And there was only one year where I taught my entire load um, online uh, when one of my sons was born, which was quite a long time ago. Um, and it was exhausting. I gotta tell you, it was exhausting. Um, so I have a lot of empathy for you as well to know um, what kind of pressure that's going to bring for you. Um, like, like our students, it's kind of easy to ignore when it's online, right? Because you know you're going to go in and, and see 50 emails. And so you're like, no, 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 I'll put that off, I'll put that off. And then once you do get on, it's just, um, it's a big hole to dig out of. So we're gonna work um, hard to share some shortcuts and effective practices um, to engage students on a one-to-one -one basis, initiate contact with them. 
But more importantly, what will really help you is to have students be um, peers, peer facilitators, to have that kind of um, co-creating of your course and co-instruction. I realize those will be new concepts to some of you. So um, in the uh, faculty hub here, we're also going to have some contact for you. Um, as I said about students and having that live help um, the first week or two, we're gonna have that for faculty as well. Um, so if you would like to volunteer um, to run uh, an hour or two of live uh, peer support for your fellow faculty, um, please reach out to me and I'd be happy to uh, put you into the hub so that you can answer questions um, from your peers. Um, I can't anticipate what all of those questions are going to be, but um, if they were instructional design questions, of course, that would go to Sue and to, you know, other things like that. But as far as where to find things, um, I asked admissions and records to send you all information on how to keep attendance. That has been a struggle every semester. And uh, we've had a lot of faculty at the end of the semester that, you know, they don't know what they're supposed to submit. So good thing to get started on that early. So that partnership with other groups like admissions and records is really critical to an eCampus. Um, so how do you submit grades? How do you keep track of attendance? How do you add and drop students? Does so, somebody want to share their wisdom? How do you add students when your course is fully online or you're separated um, in time and space from your students? And Jody, one thing that's really that nice work? right now. Hi, hi, Jody. How are you? Hi, I'm good. You're good. Good to hear your voice. And see your see your beautiful face. Oh, thank you. Um, yeah, I was just adding. I was going to add uh, that what's really uh, so helpful, and unfortunately, it's kind of a result of what's going on right now, is that we're getting our ad codes through our email as opposed to having to, uh, if we had before, as adjunct, you have to come into campus to pick them up. But now we've got our ad codes right there, right right from the get-go, and uh, actually a little bit early. So that's that's been very helpful. Very nice. So, um, so Jacqueline, Jody? yeah. Yeah, Nancy. Okay. I, I'm sorry, I didn't raise my hand. <laughs> oh, that's okay. Are you honestly near a beach? Are you in Hawaii? Yes, I am. Um, this is my uh, home away from home. No, I'm kidding. Telling me, Nancy. I wish. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we can imagine the virtual my, world. My back window, so uh, in my <laughs> office, but. <laughs> Man, I I'm wish sorry, that was I digress. The beach. <laughs> um, you, you asked how, how I add. I, I've been doing this quite a while. Um, I have scanned in the authorization uh, sheet, so I prepare a welcome letter and a scanned authorization sheet uh, to students that I'm adding, and I tell them, you know, you need to first of all go in, and, well, before the welcome letter, you need to go in and, and register, and then once they do, uh, I have them, instead of waiting for their name to pop up in the screen, because sometimes it does take a, a, a while for them to be added into the course, yeah. Uh, what I found is I'll have them, I'll have them get right back to me and send me an email that they've done that. And then I have a little bit of a, um, it, it's part of their admission in or enrollment into the course where there's about five questions where uh, they tell me their name, they tell me a little bit of background, you know, what their major is. And um, so there's about five questions there, you know, and what they want to do in the future and what do they think they're going to learn out of this course. But once they've done that, then, um, um, I, you know, once their name appears, then I give them, I give them five, five points for just doing that kind of just online. That's a, that's a, that's part of the course uh, introduction is to introduce themselves. And then um, once they've done that and they've entered in, then they're ready to go and you know, um, they start in on the course. So adding students is not, not a difficult, um, 
is, is not difficult. I try not to go right. over a moment, obviously, but uh, if I have room and I can add a student, I'll do that. Sorry Excellent. for the phone ringing. <laughs> anyway. Oh, that's um, okay. <laughs> That's okay. Yeah, so um, was that clear to everyone about how to add students? You have add codes and then you email them to each student. Jody? Yes. Uh, hi. I hi. finished up the at one training in June, and so I, I had a practice run at adding students for my two summer courses. Uh huh. And then th this is what I've done actually yesterday also. Um, Across four of my astro sections, my wait lists are completely full. So what I've done is I've manually copy pasted their emails from WebAdvisor into Canvas, and I've made them a separate group specifically called waitlisted students. And I've mm. a message to them. I've made it clear that even though they're in Canvas, they're not enrolled officially in the course. So that gives them a way to access and complete the assignments just in case a no-show happens and room opens up for me to add them after the first day of class. Is that a viable approach? <sighs> you know I'm an administrator, right? <laughs> uh -huh. can, I may, can, may, may I add something real quickly? I think the problem, the problem there might be that crossover in the drops because I have to drop a student to add a student. So I'm thinking there might be a bit of a... Oh, because the established cap on the course, is that what you're saying, Jacqueline? Yeah, it sounded like that was the case. So Dylan, I know I heard uh, about that proposed practice too, and. I really can't, um, I can't, um, it's so hard. I loved being faculty. I can't, I can't support a, a, a practice that's outside of the process of admissions and records. Is that and it? It's just that otherwise the waitlisted students would not be able to even access the course at all. Right. There's, there's no way out, outside of the normal enrollment protocols that they would do that. Yeah. So. Yeah. And I, um, it's my understanding that um, for face to face courses, we couldn't allow students to stay in um, because if they weren't enrolled in the class, you know, there were dangers of if they were injured or something like that. Um, so I'm not sure how they're transitioning that to the online environment. Um, you're, you know, I have to say that what you're demonstrating too is the power of OER. Are you using OER resources? I have in, in the past, yes. Because um, you know, students need access to course materials, um, ASAP, right, to be successful in courses. Um, I'm getting a sense too that folks um, have gotten frustrated with the process um, to get students added once they turn in that paperwork, and it's usually paper, uh, and then they get processed to be added into your Canvas course. Um, I would hope that that process would be expedited now that we're all online. Um, you don't see folks standing in line on the campus, um, but I'm, I'm making an assumption there. So, Jody, um, mm -hmm. yes. I have a question because what I do is I send the student, they generally email me asking if they can add, and I send them the ad code, and then I tell them when I, when I, get, when I get the notification from WebAdvisor that you've added, mm -hmm. uh, I tell them that it can take you know, 24 hours or so to get added to Canvas. But what I, what I tell them is if, if I see you're not added to Canvas, I go into people and I add them. Mm -hmm. As soon as yeah. I see that they're added on WebAdvisor. Right. Yeah, um, I know it's a little tricky. Um, I think what we're hearing here already, though, is people have a different approach, right? Um, so this is all the more reason that if we're going to have an eCampus, we need to have alignment and collaboration with all of these different offices that are part of the life cycle of our students at Fresno City College, all the way from being interested um, to uh, completing, transferring, and uh, becoming alumni. You know, so I think we have some bugs uh, to work out. In fact, I'm almost sure of it. 
which is um, all the more reason that we do need to connect and, and communicate with each other, uh, try to offer guidance, and um, provide those offices what they need, um, while at the same time uh, putting students first. So thank you for sharing those practices. Um, Missions and records can be a little tricky for um, those who have taught with distance ed too uh, when it comes to the end and submitting grades and attendance. So I really do uh, expect some guidance from admissions and records um, soon. Uh, so financial aid is also on um, the student support hub. Um, many, many of our students are on financial aid. And so um, that's a, a really important site for them. Um, as you know, uh, online counseling is an important aspect of an e-campus too, so that um, students can get their student education plan. And if they have um, adjustments to their schedules, that they can get help with, um, with that from a counselor. Um, I've learned a lot through my uh, relationship with Lori Swain who's been very patient with me to try to help me understand um, that process um, because they are all processes. Um, and if we expect our students to understand those, it really helps if we have accurate information. So putting everything condensed into a student hub and a faculty hub is meant to help support that. Um, I have never heard anyone say, I really like, I really like hunting around on our website. That's fun. <laughs> I love scavenger hunts. <laughs> Said no one ever. <laughs> so we're trying to be sensitive about that and uh, pull all this in together. Um, so any other questions about, about um, those two things? Emissions and records, financial aid? So we can ask another question that was posed in the chat, chat earlier. Yes. Um, so it's uh, the question is from Nancy Mitchell and she's asking two of my ASL classes are synchronous. How can I take graded attendance in Canvas for the students participation on Zoom without creating so many columns in the Canvas gradebook? Oh, yes. Um, so uh, I would advise that you attend Christina McCollum Mar Martinez's a workshop on the gradebook. Um, so that will be a, a terrific opportunity. Um, she's the chair of our distance ed advisory committee, uh, peer facilitator, and um, really just highly knowledgeable about the inner workings of Canvas. Um, so I don't have a specific answer for that, Nancy. Um, you know, there is an attendance tool in Canvas, and I really don't want to offer more information that might lead to more confusion rather than a concise answer. So um, I hope that's okay. Um, I like that we're getting so many questions and suggestions in chat too, um, so that we can uh, build a better system for you. Okay. All right. So, uh, financial aid, missions and records. Oh, the library and the bookstore, right? Uh, so you need course materials. Um, I called, uh, I think it was on a different meeting. I said, um, we're gonna talk about the F word now. <laughs> and it was for Follett. <laughs> so, you know, I gotta make myself laugh. Um, so last year, I think people were, you know, uh, could relate to Follett that way. Um, so getting course materials quickly is really important for students. Um, a lot of faculty have moved to OER. That's what I was asking Dylan about. So open educational resources, which are uh, free or low cost digital um, classroom materials that are available from day one for students. Um, so they're very easy to um, import into your campus shelf. So that's a route that some folks have gone into. Uh, nothing like a student getting delayed on trying to get a textbook. Um, that was one of the issues last year, you know, when we had students who were trying to use their vouchers for books uh, through Follett and they were having some challenges there. Um, I'm pleased to say that we do have this bookstore icon here. This was just added, 
uh, Monday. Um, so it, it directly goes to Follett. Um, it's active for students right now. So whatever section they're in, um, the materials are, are uh, presented for them that are connected to that. So they don't have to do a search in there as well. It's connected to their name, the section number, and you as the instructor. So that's a pretty sweet um, resource that the bookstore has provided. And then the library is still continuing to have their services um, remotely. Uh, so they have uh, an active website. There's a lot of information in there, including the ability to chat with a librarian for both uh, you and or the students. So I encourage you to check those out. Um, I'm kind of curious if they're going to be doing library tours. You know, like um, they would do when we were on campus. I haven't heard about that yet. Um, so Jody, you're muted. My dog made me do it. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so uh, we have a lot of other resources too for students. Um, and I've found that not many folks have been aware of this. And I, I'm extremely um, excited about the presence of NetTutor in uh, Canvas. Um, we have tutors that um, work at Fresno City College. There's LSI. Um, there's other embedded tutors in some of the classes, but then we also have access to our um, tutors at Fresno City. Uh, when you go into any one of your uh, courses, you will see, um, I'm going to show you my messy dashboard now. Don't judge, okay? <laughs> it's a very messy dashboard. <laughs> ah, there it is. Um, so when you go into one of your classes um, and your students can see this as well, that there are links for two different um, options of tutoring. So we have uh, the FCC Tutoring Center here uh, that you can uh, then be redirected to our uh, library services. Um, so you can see that they have a list of all of the different centers that they have. Um, all of them are connected through Zoom, and I'm not sure um, how students, if they, they're all drop-ins or if they make appointments. I actually don't have that information, um, but there's some guidelines here as well. Um, they do list the discipline um, expertise of the tutor that's available, and then the hours that they are available. Um, many times these are very limited hours, but it's really a good opportunity for students to engage with um, peer support. It's often somebody who has had the, the class with you before, and so they can really help guide the students. Um, we have another option as well. Um, I'm gonna leave the student view here. We have another option as well that's called NetTutor, right here. And NetTutor is a 24 seven, 365 days a year uh, tutoring service um, that students do not have to uh, be referred, they, it's self-referral. Um, and what I find really intriguing about this is the number of disciplines that they have. So if you teach a discipline that you might have normally assumed that there's no tutoring for because it's so unique, um, you can direct your students to go into NetTutor. Um, all of the tutors that they have have to have a minimum of a BA or BS um, to, to assist. And they are um, stationed probably remotely now, geez. Um, they're stationed in Florida and um, Arizona, um, and the, the people who help out with NetTutor are often retired teachers and faculty. So it makes sense that they would be in Florida and Arizona to me. <laughs> Maybe they'll open an office in Palm Springs too. <laughs> but in any case, um, you can find, uh, or your students can find qualified tutors through here. Um, 
And uh, what, when I was saying about finding this really intriguing is because when I did teach history, uh, my students could only get a tutor if one wasn't busy. And if one uh, was able to tutor in history, that was already primarily tutoring in English and math. So what I would have uh, given to have this kind of tutoring service uh, for students in history for those large capped classes um, and of course writing assignments and so many things. So um, I'm, uh, I'm envious that you have this, this connection. Um, let me show you, um, I just wanna show you a screenshot or two of what NetTutor looks like. And also um, as I'm introducing it to you, um, being cognizant though that we have had a lot of people who have used it. Um, I'm gonna do that uh, control plus thing again here. All right, um, we've had a lot of a lot of instructors find um, NetTutor for their students. Um, this quilt uh, represents the different um, disciplines that have sent students to NetTutor and the number of folks um, from those disciplines. So the larger the, the quilt piece, uh, the more that they have sent students. Um, it's not a competition, uh, but we see that English reading and writing are the number one um, discipline that is accessed by students. Of course, math is here, a couple of different kinds of math. Um, and then you get into chemistry, sociology, history, um, accounting, these two tiny ones down here represent economics and all kinds of other things. So I encourage you, if you're curious, if this is available, to go in and um, see what's available to your students. Um, Joe, I would, yeah. It, it's important for people to know that the English writing and reading part in NetTutor is turned off while our on-campus writing and reading center is open. Um, that's true. So that's the one section that's not actually 24-7. And if you have students that are frustrated, tell them to look at the open hours um, and they have to use our Zoom. Uh, the NetTutor part doesn't open until our Writing Reading Center closes. Right, um, so it's overflow for those, yeah. Um, thank you for, for pointing that out, Tammy. So at any time we do have um, tutors available. There, the 24-7, 365 um, for Net Tutor is English and math, because um, you know those are the um, two disciplines that students uh, have the most trouble with and need the most support. Um, this one that I pulled up for you here um, is for chemistry, and you can see the hours. They've tried to schedule these when students are most commonly on, um, on the internet in Canvas. And so there's a lot of weekends and evenings, um, which is when our tutoring center on campus is not open. So it's a great compliment <clears throat> to, um, to helping students. And we always encourage them as you do, you know, um, don't wait till, till you're absolutely um, confused before you seek out tutoring. Um, some folks have assigned um, going to a tutoring session as part of their courses to um, demonstrate that, that lead to students um, and so that they are comfortable um, and they are aware of the process and what kind of help that they can get. Um, with that, I wanted to share another, uh, da, 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 there it is, another uh, screenshot from NetTutor. Um, and this, this is exactly what um, Tammy was talking about, uh, about uh, the hours of all of these um, common uh, disciplines that are available. And then you can see them represented. I, I put this together so you could see that there are more uh, discipline topics that are available. Um, I wouldn't be surprised if you're looking for yours. You're biased, right? You're looking for yours. I see my name. Um, you know, kind of like looking at one of those turnstiles in a store and going, where's my name? Did they spell it right? Very exciting. Um, if you don't see your discipline topic here, um, they still might have it. So if you do not see it, please um, feel free to send me an email and um, we can see if it's available and just not um, activated on here. 
Um, another really cool feature about um, NetTutor is the appointment feature. I want to make that bigger. Um, the appointment feature. Mm -hmm. Let's see, I'm going to have to go through this. Sorry. Okay, so the appointment feature here is really uh, fantastic for our students um, who do, don't want to wait for drop in. And so I just took a screenshot of what that looks like for students. This one in particular is for nursing. Um, and nursing has uh, most of their hours on the weekends, um, but then Tuesday nights as well. And so you can make an appointment, a student can make an appointment and choose how they'd like to be reminded about that appointment um, and how early they would like to be reminded via text or email. And um, then they get put in the queue. And so they can come back for their appointment. It's pretty cool. Again, um, does anybody know for our on-ground tutoring, our virtual on-ground tutoring, do they have appointments? Yes, they do. Yes, they do. There we go. Excellent. So um, again, two resources for you and your students, because we really do want to keep supporting them in their academic efforts. Um, a part of having an eCampus as well, and you're probably really starting to realize this, gosh darn it, um, is that um, it can be a challenge to create a sense of community in the classroom. Um, we're gonna have some workshops exactly on that. Um, there's a researcher uh, whose name is Garrison, and he has this, um, this foundation uh, for teaching that's been around for a long time. I mean, 30 years called the community of inquiry and maybe you've heard of that in some of the equity uh, presentations that Luke and Wood have presented. They uh, use the foundation of Garrison's community of inquiry and in that um, inquiry it emphasizes the three presences and that is the social presence in the class, cognitive presence, um, and the teaching presence. And in those three, there's a lot of evidence-based research on what is effective. And then Luke and Wood add the equity um, presence in all of those categories. So it's really um, fascinating. We're gonna um, have a, a series that explores those ideas. And so you can um, make connections to how you can do that as you're designing and virtually teaching your courses. Um, so creating a sense of community um, is important because unlike having a scheduled physical space, you know, on campus, your students have to choose to go online. Um, and they can ignore that sometimes. Um, but if you have that relationship with them, that makes them want to come to class, that they have an excitement for learning that goes beyond that first week, then their cognitive uh, abilities are higher. So um, building that community and connection means recognizing students as people. I know that sounds kind of basic, but we have been exposed to more than ever in student surveys about the things that are additional challenges for them because of COVID-19. And um, uh, trying to understand those and provide uh, an effective teaching and learning environment um, despite those challenges. One of the things that we adopted last year um, that is about that creating um, community and recognizing the social presence in the classroom is name coach. Um, so a show of hands or reactions, how many of you have your name recorded in name coach? I see just a couple of hands. There's more coming up. You recorded your name in name coach. All right, this is your homework for today. Uh, go in and record your name and name coach. You can do it with your cell phone as well. But <clears throat> this even happened yesterday, right? 
there was um, this footnote when, when a couple of names were read, right? That footnote is, oh, I'm sorry if I butchered your name or I didn't say it right. Okay, when that happens in the classroom, um, it's awkward, it's uncomfortable for both the person saying the name and the person whose name it is. And so we'll have some students, right, that will shorten their name, or we have Hmong students who will just change their name and replace it with a Western name because it's easier. But that's giving up a piece of their identity, right, to accommodate the person they're interacting with. So what if you had to do that? That doesn't establish a very good relationship. You already have a little cloud there um, that says, um, I'm not respecting and honoring you. Your name is the most important thing to you and your identity. Um, this happened to me too um, when I was in college. I would always be very anxious uh, before the instructor got to my name. And you know it's in alphabetical order. So I'd be very anxious, wanting to catch them before they said it. I was not very successful. And so then I would be embarrassed. Um, my, uh, I'm older now, so I'm not as embarrassed, but uh, my, my uh, birth name is Jodette. And when I would say that with kind of that awkward, yeah, it's Jodette, isn't that, you know, whatever. Uh, <laughs> I would, um, I'd footnote it and I'd give the person who I was telling my name Sort of, sort of an out, you know, but I go by Jody, you know, oh yeah, my mom named me after a belly dancer, you know, was conceived at a Doors concert, yeah, she was 20. Um, so then it led it, that's true, true story. So then it led it to actually building more trust and connection because I was vulnerable to saying how my name was, uh, how, I, how I got my name. So um, in Name Coach, we have uh, become a power user. Um, I think this is representative of how um, caring our faculty are. Um, Name Coach was brought to us for free as a, a beta test last year, and we just ran with it. It's such a small, simple act that has a big impact on students and on faculty as well. Some faculty names are a little difficult for some to pronounce. So um, this is really stunning. Uh, last year, and this number, by the way, is only up to last February. Believe it or not, I haven't had a chance to go in and check the data on this one. But up until February, um, we had over 10,000 names recorded. It's crazy. Um, but more importantly are the playbacks, right? So of those names, 21,142, we had um, that many playbacks. So not only were people recording their names, but others were listening to them. That's pretty cool, right? Um, I've heard uh, some faculty names, because I'll go through and play them. And some faculty did more than just, you know, like an answering machine, Jody Steely. <laughs> you know, so they would make it fun. Um, and they'd say, uh, yeah, my name is Jody Steely. I'm your instructor for this semester, but you know, you can call me uh, Miss Steely. So you know, add a little more personality to it than just Jody Steely. Um, and there's the ability to spell out phonetically um, your name as well. And I know you probably made those little notations in your, your uh, roster, right? To try and uh, remind yourself how to say someone's name. So struggle no more. Uh, it's true that online, you don't get to say a person's name as often as you would in person. You don't have to call out their name when you're handing back papers, okay? But when you're in a Zoom session like this, the power to call on somebody um, personally and use their name uh, correctly and say it correctly really goes a long way. And for many first year students, it's an indication that you see me I do belong here, my name's important, I've, I'm valued. So it really is just a small thing um, and over 3,000 courses um, up to last February um, had active name coach in there. Um, so students can use their phones to record their names, you, you can too. 
um, and uh, put in your pronoun um, if you'd like. We uh, just activated the pronoun feature in Canvas too. I don't know if you guys noticed that, but um, if you haven't, you can go into your profile and make an edit. And we have four choices there um, that you can choose your pronoun. Um, this is also another rec uh, recognition of valuing um, differences amongst students um, and respecting their identities. And again, that's very powerful and fits into um, Garrison's community of inquiry. If we want to go to the research part, it really fits in there um, to, to have students um, feel connected to the course. So we, um, you know, the eCampus is, it's, it's vast. It's, uh, it takes a lot of pieces to build that. Um, and I think we're on our way um, to a really good start. Um, one last thing uh, before we move on, um, I showed you the Faculty Support Hub, and I'm going to put this in there. Um, and this is a list of workshops. Um, I got to tell you, I'm going to be honest, that in the past, when we've had workshops, sometimes nobody would come. Nobody would come. And it was sad because we put so much work into it. We're ready. And then nobody would show up. Um, it's deflating. <laughs> I have a feeling though now as a positive outcome of COVID, we're going to have lots of people in our professional development. I can't say that a flex session has ever had 200 people in it, even if it was offered at two different times, cumulatively, never 200 people. And what I'm really hoping as these workshops offer an opportunity for you socially uh, to help feed you and help connect you to your fellow faculty members. And we're not gonna be all business in these. We're gonna have icebreakers. We're going to have interaction. And some of these workshops are actually going to be flipped meaning that you'll be set, well, first of all, you get to register, right? We could have known if people weren't coming to our party if we had a registration system in the past. You know, then we can know, oh, let's go out to lunch instead, nobody's coming. Um, but uh, we do have the ability now to register, for faculty to register. And um, in taking advantage of that, and also uh, cognitive theory for adult learning, we're going to flip uh, many of these workshops. And what that means is that you'll get materials in advance so that you can come to the workshop prepared to engage with the material and your peers. Imagine that. It sounds exciting, right? So um, we're really looking forward to that style. Um, Sue Yang's going to demonstrate some of the interactive engaging features of Zoom because it doesn't have to just be all a monologue, right? So she's gonna show some of those advanced features. And when we have these workshops, we're gonna employ those as well. Uh, we're going to have um, groups and polls and a use of a whiteboard. And um, you know, groups that when they come back, there's a, a reporter that tells us what they discovered. We're gonna encourage faculty to take notes, you know, keep a journal. Uh, nothing like leaving a workshop and then saying, you know, gosh, I wish I would have written that down. And let's be honest, how many, how many people go back and watch video workshops? My queue has about 150 and it just makes me feel guilty to go look at them. So I know that for me, I have to attend live or I'm just not gonna get it. <laughs> and so um, maybe you're that way as well. Um, so these workshops are going to be exciting, opportunity to engage with your peers, um, and so I'm really looking forward to that and I hope that you will join us. We are, um, we are aware of your cognitive overload as well. Um, so these are going to be scaffolded pieces. They're not gonna be overgeneralized. They're going to be on a specific practice. They will have objectives um, and so you'll know uh, what you're going into in the workshop, the hands-on, 
uh, opportunity and then what you should uh, should have learned at the end of it. So we're hoping that we can model some of those um, those interactive uh, learning pieces for virtual workshops. So again, I'm really excited about that. Um, I'm really excited about the fact that we have so many people who can lead these workshops. Um, so our first week, next week coming back, I mentioned this about um, the grade book. This will just be on the grade book, right? So you can come in, have your Canvas course open and do it right there with Christina. Um, so this one uh, we're offering twice next week. These will be repeated depending on how uh, popular they are. So uh, you can see the schedule there uh, next Wednesday and Thursday. We're trying to mix them up um, to offer on different days and times so that um, everybody has a chance to, to choose to come live. Um, video screen capture and captioning. Uh, that's a big one that many people uh, feel uneasy about. Um, and so we're going to show you some pretty simple ways to do this. I'm not gonna say easy, because I think that that word is overused, because what may be easy for me isn't easy for another person, right? So when I say simple, I mean a couple of steps. So I hope that you can join um, Carolyn Deanda for that um, next Wednesday as well, Wednesday and Thursday. Um, my, my gut feel is that that one's gonna be really popular and we'll have a lot of sessions on it. Workshops, workshops. Um, here's a, another uh, group of workshops. This one here is the three-day humanizing challenge with At One. Uh, Michelle Pekansky Brock is just um, a beautiful human being that cares a lot about students and that holistic uh, treatment of students, that social and, and community interaction with them, because only by feeding those parts of the framework can you um, enable the cognitive uh, part to thrive. So this one here, um, there's separate registration for it. It's very unique. There's um, four scheduled hours over the three days, but then there are asynchronous activities too. Um, and some of my very, very well-respected peers are, are leading that throughout one. So separate registration, we'll send that link out to you. Um, making your simple syllabus beyond simple. Um, Carolyn DeAnda is gonna lead that one too. Now that you've learned the basics of simple syllabus, how do you make it represent your, your persona? and establish your presence in Canvas. And Carolyn has some really great um, tips and tricks for that. Uh, Zoom for synchronous sessions. There's one um, similar to that uh, today. Sue Yang's going to uh, bring that back next week. Um, this one here, promoting active learning and student engagement. Um, this actually comes to us from a, a research group called the Charles M. Dana Center and they uh, have these unique professional de in development opportunities that are, um, that are built around evidence-based research and uh, the commitment that every student can learn. So uh, this one here on promoting active learning and student engagement is about supporting academic integrity uh, without surveillance um, and creating activities and assessments that map to your student learning outcomes and culturally responsive uh, teaching strategies that motivate learning. Um, that's based on the work of uh, Zaretta Hammond. This was actually two hours um, and there will be materials um, before. Um, and then this one here is on establishing pedagogy first and choosing tools second. Um, people are so generous in giving, right? They'll tell you a tool that they're using and that they really like it. But how does it impact learning? Would that tool actually fit in with the outcomes that you have? How do you decide? You know, what should you use to evaluate um, a tool um, and uh, discover if it does align with your pedagogy? So we're gonna explore that. This is another two hour session that uh, comes to us from the Dana Center, uh, prior materials, hands-on, uh, interactive, um, and it's a two hours that go by incredibly fast. Um, and that's in the second week. We have more coming, more workshops and, and series coming. 
in the chat, somebody recommended um, something on Teams. And I said, I'd like to go to that one too. <laughs> because I'm, I don't know everything. Uh, none of us do, right? We're all lifelong, because we're lifelong learners. Right? Uh, open minds. All right. Joby, can uh, I ask yeah. a, a quick question for you? Yeah. It's just blowing up in the chat. Okay. Now that, that you've introduced these um, workshops, people want to know how do they register for them? Yes, um, and that is an excellent question. Um, I messaged Susie um, Nitzel. She's going to help us set up the registration for these. Um, and that, uh, not a good day to ask her that. <laughs> so, um, but she's going to help us out with the CVENT registration. Um, we delayed um, starting them until Tuesday. Um, and so if we don't get the CVENT set up for uh, the ones on Tuesday, right, you always have to have a backup plan. Um, then we'll just have those open. We'll just send out an open Zoom um, for folks to attend. Um, Jody, I apologize. Our live captioner has to go to another session. I know we're 15 minutes past our time. Would you okay. like to, what did you recommend that we do? I know you're you still include. discussing. Okay, yeah, we'll thank you. Yeah, thank you for the captioning. Um, thank you, everyone. You will get a notice in Canvas that the Faculty Hub is open and ready for you. I appreciate your time today, and I wish you the best as you start Monday. And we're here for you, because together we're stronger. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Thank you very much. Before you. we get off, too. Bye. Bye, Joseph. Bye, Rob. See you in space. <laughs> the final frontier. <laughs> Thank you, Steven. Jim's at the beach too. <laughs> beach or space? <laughs> Anywhere but here. <laughs> yeah, Christine, I know. I think you're in your kitchen, huh? It's a good place too. Will we get a copy of the PowerPoint? Absolutely, yes. We will uh, post it in um, both the uh, Flex, I think it's a SharePoint site, and also in the Faculty Hub. Sorry, you're Super, over Super, thank you. <laughs> you're welcome. Bye, Colleen. Bye, Chris. This is a side language interpreter. Thank you so much. I'm gonna be logging out now. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Peter. Alrighty. Take care. Bye -bye. Thank you, Peter. Thank you, of Kristen. Course. Thank you. I'll let her know. Thank you. Bye-bye. Impressive plane there. Alrighty. I am going to stop the recording. You can tell your uh, 